It's, it's, it's my, my pleasure to introduce Mark McLean from Stony Brook University. Uh, he's going to tell us today about complex cobordism, Hamiltonian loops, and global Kerenishi charts. OK, great. Um, OK, so, so what I thought I'd do is, is I'll just start out straight away by telling what our main theorem is. So, oops. Oh, wrong slide. One second. That's the correct. Yeah. <clears throat> so we, we start with a closed symplectic manifold, which I'll call P. And we have a smooth submersion whose fibers are symplectic submanifolds. And we, we're just submersing to CP1. And we're going to just choose a fiber, like the fiber of a one or something. And I'm going to let that be our, a, uh, that's a symplectic manifold. I'm going to let it be X. <clears throat> and then this is our main theorem, well, one of our main theorems, which is the cohomology of P is the same as the cohomology of the <clears throat> corresponding trivial vibration. Okay, so from the perspective of cohomology over Z, um, this is trivial. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our main theorem. And I'll spend most of this talk explaining this theorem. And the, but we have another theorem, which is more general, which I'll call theorem two, but it's just a more general version of theorem one. And that says <clears throat> that uh, this, this, this vibration, this, this, uh, the cohomology of this vibration splits is also trivial. It's the cohomology of the fiber tensor, the cohomology of the base. Um, and this is true for any complex oriented cohomology theory. Okay. Um, I'm not going to explain in detail what a complex oriented cohomology theory is, but um, it's basically any generalized cohomology theory, i.e., you know, all the Eilenberg steamroad axioms hold except the point axiom. Um, and it, it, it's where, you know, churn classes make sense, basically. So, so th those are our main results. And I want to explain the sort of techniques we use. Most of this talk, I'll focus on the techniques we use to, to, to prove this result. Um, uh, this, this, vibrate, this, uh, this vibration pi is, 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 is what we call a Hamiltonian vibration because uh, P is a closed symplectic manifold. So the total space, it, if the fibers are symplectic and, and it's induced from a closed symplectic form on the total space, then it's called a Hamiltonian vibration, which means the sort of monodromy maps are, are, are Hamiltonian. Okay, so let me just explain what was proven previously. So I think Lalonde, McDuff, and Polterovich proved theorem one for monotone symplectic manifolds. And McDuff proved um, that this, this splitting holds with rational coefficients for all symplectic manifolds. So for all P, the cohomology is the tensor product of the cohomology of the fiber with the base with Q coefficients. And also, even in the algebraic case, both theorems are new. So if P is a smooth projective variety and pi is a smooth morphism to CP1, and so by smooth morphism, I mean there are, there are no singularities, then, um, then uh, this, this splitting holds. And this was again proven over Q by Deleen. Um, but over Z, it's not known. And uh, I think we asked some experts and they don't know how to prove it um, over Z in general. Okay. Um, okay, let me give you some sort of, well, I was going to use, use examples, but it's really non-examples. So I'm going to give you some examples where 
the theorem doesn't hold if you weaken any of the conditions. So the first condition you could do is you could weaken the notion of Hamiltonian vibration to the notion of symplectic vibration. So a symplectic vibration is a vibration where the fibers are symplectic submanifolds and you have a connection so that the parallel transport maps are uh, sym symplectomorphisms. And um, basically we're just drop, it is that the difference between Hamiltonian and symplectic is that the, the, we weaken the condition that the, the, the total space P has a symplectic form. It just has a closed two form whose restriction to each fiber is a symplectic form and the, the parallel transport maps given by these sort of orthogonal type of uh, orthogonal um, distribution. Um, give, uh, that, that's our connection. So, so uh, a counter example, so, so if we just weaken it to symplectic vibration, then, then you, you can look at the hot surface. So the fibers are tori and um, the sort of parallel transport, the, the sort of monodromy maps are sort of given by sort of um, sort of linear shift, like shifting maps of the torus. <clears throat> um, also, theorem two does not hold for all generalized cohomology theories. So we can, um, so, so, there, um, so if you look at the Hitzebrook surface, so the Hitzebrook surface is, you take CP2, uh, you take CP1 times CP1 and you blow up at a point and there's a, a vibration which is given by the lines going through that blown up point. So this is a CP1 bundle over CP1, um, but you can compute, um, well, you can show sort of indirect, you, you, can, you can show that co cohomology with respect to um, real K theory <clears throat> Uh, doesn't split, so it does. It's not the same as a trivial vibration. Okay. Can I ask kind of a pretty yes. silly, silly question? But in your first bullet, like, is would there be? Is there any chance you could use this to like prove certain manifolds don't have a symplectic structure? I, is, uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess it wouldn't quite imply that because it would be saying there's no symplectic structure sort of compatible with the vibration structure you already have or something, but. Yeah, I could believe something along those lines. Um, I always feel that proving that no manifolds have a certain, mani certain you know, formal symplectic manifolds don't have a symplectic structure is really challenging and, or, it may be false, I just don't know. Um, yeah, I, I could believe I could believe that some theorem along those lines, you know, there's no, you know, you're given a smooth vibration, there's no sort of some Hamiltonian vibration structure on it or something. <clears throat> okay, so let me give you an alternative description of this vibration P. P so so that the vibration pi. Can, can be described via the clutching construction. So let me just very quickly go through this. Um, so basically it's described by a loop of Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms. So, so our fiber is still X and now, and now we have a loop of Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms. And then we define P which I'm also going to write as P sub phi, and I, throughout the lecture I'll write it as P sub phi from now on. And you just take two trivial vibrations over the disk, disk cross X, and this one means a first copy, and disk cross X, and this two means the second copy of it. And we glue these two vibrations along their boundary using this loop you know, via this identification. So this is the standard clutching construction if you have a loop of Diffeomorphisms, you can construct a vibration this way. If you live a loop of Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms, you get a, a, a Hamiltonian vibration. If you have a loop of symplectic diffeomorphisms, you get a symplectic vibration. Like the hot surface is just 
the, the, the loop given by a linear flow. You need to take a linear symplectic vector field and flow along it. And then the, it has a natural projection map to CP1 because you can just project to this disk D and CP1 is just two disks glued together. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so if you have a Hamiltonian loop, you have an associated sweep out map. And the sweep out map is, is, is sort of, well, it describes what you do. You have a cycle and you just sweep it out by the loop of diffeomorphisms. Okay. So it, in math language, it sends alpha to the push forward of the fundamental class of S1 cross alpha. But this is the sort of image you should have in your mind. You know, you have your cycle alpha and then you sweep it around using the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Okay. And we have a corollary of uh, theorem one and two, which is the sweep out map vanishes. So there's also a generalized cohomology theory version of it and the sweep out map vanishes. Okay. So let me explain briefly why theorem one implies that the sweep out map vanishes. So what's the idea? The idea is to look at the, uh, the SER spectral sequence that computes the cohomology of P. Here it is. And you can show that the differential on the E2 page is exactly the sweep out map. And by theorem one, we know that this spectral sequence degenerates and hence the sweep up map vanishes. Okay. And as I said, there's a sort of similar, similar uh, argument in the generalized cohomology world too. Okay. Okay, so what I want to focus on is, I just want to focus on the proof of theorem one. And if I have time, and I may not have time, I will talk about the proof of theorem two. Um, the, yeah, so, I, but first of all, I'm going to prove it in the, in the, 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 the sort of easy case where all moduli spaces are like nice smooth manifolds and all the evaluation maps are nice smooth submersions and everything is as nice as it can be. So, so the idea is to construct a section of the natural fiber restriction map. So you have a natural map of cohomology groups from from the from from our, the total space of our vibration p to x, you know this is just restricting forms to our fiber, and we want to construct a section of that, i.e., a map S going in the other direction, so that if I compose S with the map back with the restriction map, I get the identity map on x. Okay, so that's a section of this map. Okay, and I mean when I say section, it's got to be a you know, a, uh, a, a group homomorphism. <clears throat> and so once I have this section, I get, my, I, I get my isomorphism that I want. So I have the cohomology of X tends to the cohomology of CP1. That's the same as the cohomology of X direct sum, the cohomology direct sum this relative cohomology group, because, you know, the cohomology of CP1 is just rank two, it has, it's just Z plus Z, one Z in degree zero and one Z in degree two. And so, you know, this tensor product is just two copies of the cohomology of X and one is shifted up by, um, by two degree, but by, by a de you know, one is shifted up in by two degrees. And um, that's the same, you know, that's, this is the same as the cohomology of X um, shifted up by two. And then there's a natural map from this direct sum um, to the, the cohomology of the total space of our vibration. 
and it's just um, well this this Q is just the quotient map from P phi to P phi going to P phi go to this relative cohomology group and S is our section and okay so all we need to do is construct this map this is where moduli spaces will start appearing are there questions about this okay so let's start with let's start constructing our section s so as i said we're going to we need to construct appropriate moduli spaces of curves and and we start with the blow up of cp1 times cp1 at the origin so i'm thinking of cp1 as the riemann sphere so the zero is the origin and i'm going to construct and i can you can just sort of build a hamiltonian vibration which i'm going to call p tilde over this um blow up s this and um and it has the following properties the first thing is if I restrict this vibration to the exceptional divisor of this surface S, then I get my original Hamiltonian vibration that I want to study, which is P phi. Okay. And then what I want is somehow, um, I want certain regions of this Hamiltonian vibration. So, so over certain regions of S, I want this Hamiltonian vibration to be trivial. So I want it to be trivial over the line CP1 cross infinity inside S. So that's, you know, that's disjoint from the blow up locus of so CP1 cross infinity. It's just a line. And I'm gonna call this copy of CP1 infinity, I'm gonna call it P inf uh, So because, because it's a trivial vibration, I'm gonna write this trivial vibration. I'm gonna give it a name, I'm gonna call it P infinity. Also, I want, um, uh, yeah, oh, this is not quite right. What I want is the restriction of P tilde to the proper transform of this line. So this line goes through the blow up locus. And I want the restriction of P tilde to the proper transform of this line going through the blow up locus. I want that to also be a trivial vibration. Okay, so I'll draw a, I'll draw a, I have a picture on the next slide sort of illustrating all of this. Here it is. So, so P tilde factor it, it, it is, um, this is my schematic picture of P tilde. And um, uh, really this picture represents the base S. And I'm also have an additional projection map to CP1, which is just to one of the CP1 factors of CP1 cross CP1. <clears throat> and P infinity is hit this, this line here, this is CP1 uh, cross infinity, and the vibration over it is CP1 cross X, it's trivial. And then I also have um, this red line, which is the line, the proper transform of the line CP1 zero cross CP1, um, and this is, um, uh, this is, a, I'm gonna call this the um, CP1 cross X hor for horizontal, I'm gonna call this, and the, 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 the vibration P tilde is trivial over this red line as well as over this blue line, and over the exceptional divisor, which is this curved line here, um, that 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 is um, p phi, which is the one I want to study, and also if I look at the line, uh, the proper transform of the line um, uh, c p one cross zero, um, then then I have uh, the, the 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 simple the Hamiltonian vibration associated to the loop going in the opposite direction. So a way to think about this is is as a family of Hamiltonian vibrations. You start, it's parameterized by CP1. You start with a trivial vibration here, which is this blue line, and it degenerates 
to a fibration over a nodal curve, which is just CP1 cross CP1 wedge CP1. And over one of the CP1s is the fibration we wish to study, P phi. Okay, so this is the, the, the fibration we're interested in. And um, are there any questions about this or misunderstandings? Something that you don't understand. Okay. So next we choose an appropriate almost complex structure on P tilde. And we look at the a moduli space on it. And I'm going to call it MH. This is the moduli space of genus zero pseudo-holomorphic maps mapping to this Hamiltonian fibration P tilde. And um, it has each curve has two marked points, and it represents um, a sort of the the, the class CP one times point, which um, it in the fiber P in, in P infinity, which which I'm thinking of as a class inside H two of P tilde. Okay, and one of the marked points I'm going to constrain to the red line that I drew this CP1 cross X hor horizontal. And the other mark point is free. Okay, so that's MH. So, so this is a moduli space of curves. It's uh, virtual dimension is exactly the same as the dimension of P tilde. As I said, it, I'm assuming everything is nice and smooth. So it's actually, for the moment, it's a nice smooth manifold and it has a nice smooth submersion to this red line and also to uh, P tilde. Um, so I have this evaluation map. So I'm evaluating the, the free marked point to P tilde and the constrained marked point maps to the red line, which is um, the horizontal CP1 cross X. And then I have two other moduli spaces, um, which is, I, I, I look at um, the moduli spaces whose marked points maps to P phi and also maps to P infinity. So this free mark point, I either want it to stay on P phi or I want it to stay on P infinity. And those are the two sort of sub moduli spaces of MH. Okay, so if you think about it, because uh, the projection map P tilde to, uh, to, to this surface S is a whole nice holomorphic map, um, you could think of it as the, either the curves with image inside P phi union P phi inverse or inside P, P infinity. Okay, so I have a schematic picture again, where, saying where these curves are. So um, I have, so in MH here, I have pseudo holomorphic curves and, and they map to these, if I project them to my surface S, they map to these lines these fibers of this map going to CP1. And if I, and then I have two other sub moduli spaces. I have M phi and I have M infinity. And M phi is a moduli space of, of nodal genus zero curves that maps to this sort of singular vibration here. And um, M infinity is um, maps to this product vibration. And M infinity is a very simple moduli space because the, the, the holomorphic structure is a product here. And I'm looking at curves representing point uh, CP1 times point. It's just going to be the, you know, the, it's, it's identified with X basically, this moduli space M infinity. It's just the same as X. Okay. Questions? Okay. Okay, so associated to these moduli spaces, I have natural 
push-pull maps. So remember, these moduli spaces have two marked points. I pull back a cohomology class with respect to one of these marked points, and then I push it forward to, to the, other, the, the other space using the other marked point. So all three of these moduli spaces have pull back, push, push, pull maps. So I take a cohomology class in, in, in my horizontal uh, CP1 cross X, which is this red line that I drew in my diagram. I pull it back to my moduli space. I cap it with the, the, the fundamental class. It maps to here. And because the dimension of the moduli space is the same as the dimension of um, um, P phi or P infinity, um, it has this shift in degree. And then I push forward to the homology. And then I use Poincare duality to get back to cohomology. And this is a degree zero map. Okay, and similarly, I can do the same for, for MH, exactly the same thing, I get a push-pull map. So I have three push-pull maps, psi phi, psi infinity, and psi H. Okay. <clears throat> and then what you do is you just look at all these push-pull maps and put them in some big commutative diagram and hope for the best. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so you have uh, this section S that we want to construct is you, you just look at this commutative diagram, just look at it, you stare at it, and then you see it's a section. So let me explain a little bit of what's going on. Okay, so I have a push-pull map CH, I have my three push-pull maps, Psi H, Psi infinity, and Psi phi. They're all compatible, so that this, these two triangles commute. Uh, res means restrictions, so these are all natural restriction maps. And what I can do is I can look at what, I can look at a cohomology class here, and I can see what happens if I go all the way to the right-hand side of the diagram, like this. And what you see is it must be the identity map, because this moduli space here is psi infinity, as I said, th these are moduli spaces of curves in a product CP1 cross X. It's a very easy to understand moduli space. And so this push-pull map is just the projection map. And so I just, to going all the way along here is, is the same as going along the top of this diagram. And that gives you the identity map. And hence, I can construct my section S, which is this red map here. That has to be a section, because when I restrict, I get the identity. Okay, any questions about that? So is this, the, you mentioned this proof of Macduff in the rational case. Is, is this the same setup, or is this a new argument? Uh, I mean, the way we did it is kind of, I, I mean, you know, the, the way that Macduff Dusa does it is, she defines this sort of sidle map and um, you know shows it's um, you know sh shows that that so so for each vibration p phi you have a an associated map on quantum cohomology and then if you replace phi with phi inverse you have to show it's a, 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 um, a an inverse by some sort of gluing argument or something. I, I think that's how she does. But I think she has the same vibration S um, in her, her paper. So, so somehow, I, I feel like we tried to just extract the sort of minimal amount of uh, sort of the, the we, we tried to do as little as possible to get, get this result. Um, whereas I think Dusa was trying to sort of set up a kind of, you know, formalism. Um, she, she was interested in other things as well in her paper. Um, okay. Can I also just ask, so the, I mean, I could believe that in the monotone case, you just, you know, take sort of generic, almost complex structures and so on. But in the rational case, does that, th you can also do that without any like virtual perturbation? No, she uses virtual fundamental classes. I see. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's what we're using as well. And I'll explain some of how to construct them later on. QED. Okay, so now let's 
deal with the case where the, the moduli space is not nice and regular. We have a, so we have a big problem, which is the virtual fundamental class. It's usually defined over the rational Q. Um, and you know the, the moduli spaces are not nice smooth manifolds and all the evaluation maps are sort of, could be anything. Um, so what do you do? So what we want to do is, yeah, so how do we deal with Z? So, that, so first of all, it's sufficient to prove our theorem mod P to the K for every prime power. So that's the first thing we can do. And then the second thing, which is the idea, the key idea of, of Uzide and Blumberg is to use Morava K theory. Um, and it has uh, two miraculous properties. One is it somehow approximates mod P to the K cohomology. And the other is that it gives our moduli spaces a virtual fundamental class. And I'll explain these two things um, in more detail a bit in a few minutes. Um, okay, so let me just explain how you build a fundamental class first. So to, to, to describe our fundamental class, we need to describe our moduli space first in some way. And the way I would like to describe it is via a global Kirinishi chart. So this is the definition, this is our definition, but this is what, how we define global Kirinishi chart. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. So, so a global Kirinishi chart is a quadruple, G, T, E, S. G is a compact Lie group. T is a manifold, and this manifold is called the thickening, and uh, it's a G manifold. And the group action G uh, has finite stabilizers. Uh, e is a G vector bundle. So that means the group action over T, um, so E is a vector bundle over T. So what I mean is the G vector, the, the G action over T uh, lifts to a fiber-wise linear G action on the total space of E. And S is a G equivariant section whose zero locus is compact. So that's a global Kirinishi chart. Okay. And such a de chart describes a metric space M if the metric space M is homeomorphic to the zero locus of our section quotient by G. Okay. And M will be our moduli space. Okay, so that's how we want to describe our moduli space. We sort of want to put a fundamental class here, essentially. Okay. So, yeah, so global Kronishi chart. So, so, so our moduli space is just uh, the, the um, a zero set of a G equivariant section quotient by G. That's it. Um, okay, and um, one of our theorems is uh, there are global Kirinishi charts describing our moduli spaces, and we want the additional property that the tangent space of T and also E are complex G vector bundles. Um, so I'll explain that later. But at the moment, I'm just going to assume my moduli space has this structure here. So from now on, I'm just going to assume M has this structure and I want to put a fundamental class on it. So what do I do? Yeah, so how do I put a fundamental class on here? So what it, how am I, how am I going to think of a fundamental class? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to basically think of it like this. I'm going to think of it as, I mean, really, it should be a homology class, but, but I, 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 for, for our purposes, I'm just going to think about it as an element of the 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 um, the dual of cohomology. So, so K is some generalized cohomology theory, and my virtual fundamental class is just a map from cohomology of our moduli space to a point. So, it's just an element of the dual of cohomology. Um, uh, some notation, I'm, I'm going to just make my life easier. Instead of writing this all the time, I'm going to write this. 
So, so the cohomology of A sort of localized near B, which is really this. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just drop K when I can, just to avoid clutter. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to just assume some nice properties of my general co generalized cohomology theory. The first property is I'm going to assume the Tom isomorphism holds, the G equivariant Tom isomorphism holds. Um, essentially, this, this happens when this vector bundle E has, has, is oriented with respect to our generalized cohomology theory. Uh, if it's like a Morava K theory, um, e, for instance, to make it oriented, you might need a complex structure on it. And that's why I was talking about, that's why I was, that's what, what why I was assuming my moduli space, that the, 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 this E um, had, a, had a complex structure. Uh, and and um, this, is, this, fact, this is much harder to establish. We want some notion of G equivariant Poincare duality. So what I mean is basically, if you take the thickening T, and you quotient by G, you want sort of want Poincare duality for that quotient, basically. Or, um, you know, you want an identification between G equivariant cohomology of your thickening and G equivariant homology of your thickening relative to its boundary with a shift in degree where D minus K is the dimension of the thickening minus the dimension of the group, which is sort of like its dimension. Okay. So once you have a Tom isomorphism and you have Poincare duality, then you can construct a fundamental class. So, um, so yeah, such oh yeah, so so the this assumption holds over Q. It doesn't hold over Z because G might have non-trivial stabilizers, and that kind of ruins this Poincare duality thing. It, this is fine, I think, but this is this is a problem. Um, and also, uh, if yeah, as I said, the tangent space of the thickening and E are um, uh, complex G vector bundles, then then these things hold as well. And, and again, I'll explain a bit more detail later on. So this is how you build your virtual fundamental class. You start with a a relatively compact open neighborhood of your zero section. And you, you just, you, you start with the cohomology of this neighborhood. You take its Poincare dual, you push that homology class to, to E localize that T, and then you uh, apply the Tom isomorphism theorem. So basically it's just, you should just think of it as, you know, you have a, a manifold with a vector bundle over it, or really a manifold mod G with a vector bundle over it or something. And you're just uh, taking the, the fundamental class and, cap and capping it with the Tom class. And that's all we're doing really. Okay, so this is, what, this is basically what this formula means. And then to do the virtual fundamental class, actually on the moduli space, you have to take a direct limit. So these neighborhoods, you shrink as you go to the zero section and you just take a direct limit. And, you know, so this should really be sort of, you know, this sort of behaves like check cohomology or something like that. So you have these nice direct limits. <clears throat> okay. Um, so actually um, everything, you know, when, when you do virtual fundamental classes, you know, you may as well, you know, this space M is like horrible. It's like a Mandelbrot set or something like that. And sometimes it's nicer just to work with U directly or with T directly. You know, um, so so sometimes we'll just so, so practically speaking, it's sometimes easier to do that anyway because it's an U is a manifold. Okay. Questions? Um, do you know what uh, the T and the E are for the moduli spaces in your setting, or are you going to say later what they are? The oh, I'm going to say later what they are. Yes. Okay. Um, but but okay. but yeah. In, as a very quick sort of preliminary answer, T is some other moduli space, and E is some sort of natural vector bundle over it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. 
So I just want to talk about Morava K theory very quickly. Um, so when you introduce things like co cohomology theories, like say sing singular cohomology or like K theory, you know that there's some sort of explicit sort of geometric way of understanding it, like you know you have vector bundles or you have simplices and. With Morava K theory, the sort of construction really involves understanding spectra. And I, I don't really see any sort of helpful geometric ways of understanding this, but maybe experts can say otherwise. Um, so so we, we, we'll just characterize, we'll just best tell, tell you what the, the, uh, the properties, I'm just gonna tell you what the properties are of these Morava K theories. So for every prime power, I have a Morava K theory. And it's coefficient ring, so that so that the 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 homology of a point, which is which is its coefficient ring, or the cohomology of a point, which is its coefficient ring, is just um, um, Laurent polynomials with coefficients mod p k. But the the grading of v, so the, the 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 sort of important thing for us is this grading v n. Is some large number if n is large. So if n is a really big number, this 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 mod v n is a large number. So that's the most important thing for us. Okay. So you just think of this as some large number, and n is some big number. Um, but this exists for all n. <laughs> and the other property I, I'm going to assume is that at any stably complex vector bundle is oriented. So this G equivariant Tom isomorphism holds. And um, that sort of argument isn't that uh, bad. And then, but then there's a, a, a difficult theorem. Well, I think it's difficult. Cheng, uh, G equivariant Poincaré duality holds. Um, so long as um, the, the manifold has a, a, a G equivariant stable, almost complex structure you know, with finite stabilizers. Okay. So we've already seen that these two properties are useful. And now let me explain why, why, I'm, why, I, why, why we need this property here. So yeah, so as a result, we can construct virtual fundamental classes using Morava K theory from the discussion earlier. And now let me explain why the first property is useful. So if you have a CW complex, why? You have a spectral sequence computing any generalized cohomology theory of Y. Um, and its E2 page is just the usual cohomology of Y with coefficients um, in K in, in, in the cohomology of a point. Okay. <clears throat> Now remember, yeah, so, so remember in our case, the, the cohomology of a point is Laurent polynomials mod, with mod p to the k coefficients and the, um, this, the, 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 the parameter Vn um, that has a large degree. So, if our CW complex Y is finite dimensional and this Morava K theory parameter N is very large, then this atia hitzebrook spectral sequence uh, must degenerate. And because we're working mod PK, P to the K actually gives you an isomorphism between the, the E two page and the E infinity page. Um, um, you know, obviously with, you know, you have to be a little bit careful with spectral sequences if they degenerate, say, over Z, you, you know, the, the you know, torsion might be different between, say, E2 and E infinity, but, but when you're working more P to the K, it's fine. So using all these facts, we get our splitting theorem mod P to the K and hence over Z, and hence we've proved theorem one. Okay. So the only sort of, for, to prove theorem one, the, the only last bit to explain is the construction of our virtual, our, our moduli spaces, this global Kurinishi chart for our moduli spaces. So I'll do that in the last few minutes. Um, I'm afraid I don't have much time to explain theorem two, but they're on these slides and I'm, 
hopefully we'll upload them to the website. Um, so how do we construct a global current issue chart for the moduli space of gene zero curves? So I'm just going to look at I the mod Yes. A quick question. So um, the, you mentioned these sort of three properties of Morava K theory. Is, it, yeah. is there any sense in which that characterizes Morava K theory, or is it just something that works for your purposes? No, uh, no I don't think it does. Um, but there, there's a sort of way of constructing it from, from, from spectra, but using sort of various uh, properties uh, properties of spectra um, and you have to do it that way I think I think you have to like learn about spectra to, to really sort of under, understand it okay. um, but you know part of this talk is you, you my, my hope is that the takeaway from this talk is you can get very far just by not learning very much using these these properties um, Okay. Okay, so let me construct a let, let me let me just take any closed symplectic manifold. I'm going to call it M now. And I just want to construct um, the moduli space of genus zero curves, J holomorphic curves, representing a class beta. And um, and I want a global Kurinishi chart for that. So Remember, I mean this. I mean, you know, this moduli space is just it's just this. I mean, as a set, it's just this the set of all J holomorphic maps up to an equivalence, and the equivalence is, you know, two maps are equivalent if if this diagram commutes, where this this isomorphism here is a uh, is a uh, biholomorphism. Um, so Dennis Sullivan always keeps saying uh, um, that you're starting with a class and then you only get a set when you pass to the equivalence classes. So, so um, anyway, so you start with something enormous and then, and then you have, and then you get something smaller. Okay, so let me explain the problems with understanding this multiple space. So the first problem I think is that the domain sigma isn't fixed. You know, it's just a genus zero Riemann surface. And, you know, how, how do you sort of, you know these genus zero Riemann surfaces vary. They you know they they develop nodes and 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 so on. And um, so I, I want to identify the domain with something standard somehow. So the tip uh, one typical way of doing this is adding mark points to the domain. You have a Riemann surface. You just put some mark points on it, and then that identifies sigma with an, an element of M zero M bar, the moduli space of stable genus zero curves with N mark points. And, and so the domain is identified with the universal curve, you know, with a, an L, you know, you can, you can think of the domain as a, a fiber of the universal curve. Um, there's another way which was suggested by Siebert, Bernd Siebert in the late nineties. Um, and he says to do it a different way, which is you take, a basis of holomorphic sections of an ample line bundle on sigma, and that stabilizes the curve. Um, so that the, these sections identify sigma with a curve mapping to projective space. You know, you just take a basis of section, you know, uses basis of sections. Those ba that basis of sections gives you coordinates in, in um, CPD, the complex projective space of dimension D. And, and then you look at uh, the universal curve over that. And that's how you identify your domain sigma um, with something a bit more sort of standard and easier to manage. So we're gonna go this route, okay? So that's the first problem. Uh, Oh yeah, so let, let me uh, realize this problem more concretely. So um, we're gonna use, so I'm gonna call these framed curves. So you fix a Hermitian line bundle on your symplectic manifold M, whose curvature is the symplectic form basically. So, but um, you know, the symplectic form little omega may not be integral. So I, you know, I perturb it slightly to a rational symplectic form and I rescale it until it becomes integral. So I choose a, an integral symplectic form 
that uh, times j, and I choose a Hermitian bun line bundle with cur curvature in my symplectic form. And then I define something called a framed curve, which is a holomorph, which is not a holomorphic curve, it's just a smooth map. It's just a smooth map from a nodal curve to my symplectic manifold, representing my homology class, together with a basis of an all, together with an orthonormal basis of holomorphic sections of the pullback of the Hermitian line bundle. So the point is, you know, the point is, if I have a Hermitian line bundle over sigma, so I take my Hermitian line bundle L, I pull it back to a Hermitian line bundle over sigma, a Hermitian structure automatically gives you a holomorphic structure, a unique, it's genus zero, so it gives you a unique holomorphic structure on, on sigma. And so I can look at the, the, the space, you know, I, I, have, I have a notion of holomorphic section and I take a basis of holomorphic sections, okay? Um, so this, um, this, this stabilizes my, so, so, so this is how I identify my Riemann surface sigma with something standard using these sections. So given such a framed curve, we have a natural map, sigma going to complex projective space, CPD, and it maps sigma, you know, in the usual way using the basis of holomorphic sections. Um, and the point is, if I look at these curves up to sort of automorphism, the, this framing F stabilizes the, the, the automorphism group. The, the, there's no longer this basis. You know, if the automorphism group was like some finite group, it's no longer, it's now, now just one. This, these FDs fix, fix the automorphism group. Okay. So you just need to understand the moduli space of, gene, of degree D nodal curves in CPD, where D is the, 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 um, the, the degree with respect to this capital omega. So this framed, the space of framed curves, this is an infinite dimensional space. I've, I've, I've no PDE or anything yet. It's just an infinite dimensional space of curves. Okay, so as a result, the domains of these framed curves are identified with fibers of the universal curve over the automorphism free locus of this moduli space of curves of degree D and CPD. And you know, that has a nice description. The, if you forget, you know, if the curve is not nodal, then it has a nice 19th century description. This is a really nice 19th century description of this space. But when you have nodes, it's a little bit more, um, you have to work a little bit harder to, to understand this space, which is smooth. This is a smooth orbifold, but with we're, we're, this F is away from the orbifold points. So it's, it's a nice, this F is a nice smooth quasi-projective variety and C is a family of curves over it. <clears throat> so as a result, a framed curve is equivalent to a smooth map from a fiber of this universal curve to, to X essentially. And as a result, we can put a natural topology on it. You just look at the graph of all of these maps and just take the Hausdorff distance with respect to the graphs of these maps and this gives you the Gromov topology. Okay. So that's the first problem. Uh, okay, I've got five more minutes, so I'll, I'll try and speed up. Um, the second problem is the uh, linearized cauchy riemann equation is not subjective. You know, you want, you want, you know, you want transversality. Um, so, what, what do you do? You need to find a vector space which surjects onto the co-kernel. And what you want is a natural vector space. So what you do is you look at some vector, appropriate vector bundles over X cross C, and you pull them back to this space of framed curves and, um, and uh, somehow try to subject it to the co-kernel. So that's what I want to explain now. So we choose a very large integer and an ample line bundle over the universal curve C. It just has to be relatively ample, but that's fine. And for each framed curve, I, I, um, I look at the natural domain inclusion map into the fiber 
of C. And then I can define my thickened moduli space T with, so this is the, the, the same T that I want for my global Kronishi chart. Well, well, sort of all, yeah, basically. Um, so this is a moduli space of two pools, U, sigma, F, and eta, where U sigma F is our framed curve. And eta is a section, a holomorphic section of the following it, it's, well, it's, it's, it's uh, an element of this tensor product. So this is a holomorphic vector bundle over sigma. This is a holomorphic vector bundle over sigma. And I just two, choose two elements, two, two holomorphic sections, one of this and one of this. Um, this is just the, uh, you know, where the, the code, you know, where, where the, Sections of this bundle is is the is the codomain of the linearized operators. So that's why this is there. But what I've done is I've tensored it with something ample, and then I have something else ample here. And I sh and we 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 show that it we we require that it satisfies this equation. And um, so the point is this eta. There's a natural pairing. You, you, so, so you, if you have a section, a holomorphic section of H zero and a holomorphic, holomorphic section of this bundle and a holomorphic section of this bundle, you can pair off these two ample line bundles here and here, and you get a smooth section of this, this, this space here, and then you uh, pre-compose it with the the derivative of the inclusion map, and this gives you. Um, this gives you, uh, yeah. This, this gives you your um, the, the equation for your thickened modular space. Okay. Okay. I'm sort of. Um, oh yeah. So I'll just quickly finish and then, then I'll stop. So the, there's also a natural bundle over this thickened moduli space. It's just the bundle whose fiber is where eta lives. And as a result, we just have a canonical section sending eta to eta. And that's my section S for my global Kirinishi chart. And there's also a natural Lie group action that given by the unitary you, you, action of the unitary group. And it's given by just changing these framings. Equivalently in CPD, it's, it's, it's acting on CPD and that that's the same as changing the framings. And so um, this gives us our global Kirinishi chart. Um, maybe I'll just say one, yeah. Maybe I'll just say one or two more things in words. Um, um, these Kirinishi charts, we, we really, you, there's, there's, these don't necessarily have a smooth structure, but we can use smoothing theory of Lashoff to put us structure smooth structure on it after sort of stabilizing it somehow and um, we can do other sort of tricks to you know make sure all the evaluation maps are smooth submersions and so on um, and um, yeah so i'll stop i'll stop there because it's 1 p.m okay let's thank the speaker Uh, questions for Mark? I have a question. Yes. So, um, I it's, it's maybe a uh, stupid. So, uh, if if we consider the homology instead of cohomology, it should be easier, right? Because I, I, because if I think about the symplectic uh, uh, lattice fibration, which is with singular fibers. I think the homology can be calculated like if using the uh, picard lapsus map, if you look at the monodromies. Sorry, what, what simply, are you talking about P, the symplectic fibration P? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, there's no like, singularities, it's, it's a singular Yeah, if there's vibration. no singularities, uh, to calculate the homology, it's just a special case 
with no singular fibers, and the homology should be easy to cap, easier to calculate. I think the difficulty here is is because we are calculating the cohomology instead. Is, is that correct? Uh, well, I think we also prove a homology. We can prove also homology splitting as well, and it's the same difficulty as far as I can tell. Um, it's the same difficulty. Yeah. Hmm. I, th I think the, the homology. I mean, Fran Franquet duality identifies homology with cohomology of P anyway. Yeah. So it's going to be the same difficulty. But the homology theory for left shed pencils is uh, left shed vibrations is studied. Like, why is it difficult for Z? I'm still confused. Sorry, why is it still difficult? Yeah, why is it still difficult so for the I, I, I mean, I'm saying, you know, it, the, the homology of P, the, this symplectic vibration, is isomorphic by Poincare duality to its cohomology. So computing homology or cohomology is, is of the same difficulty. So then why can't we use like uh, the, the, the methods we calculate the homology for left shed vibrations to, to do it? I think it's uh, a, a classical. Well, I, uh, I think the point is that those methods work well when the base is the complex line, like contractible. But now you're closing up the base to S2 and the process of closing the Base to S2 makes the cohomology of the fiber more complicated. But the other vibrations are all over P2, uh, uh, over P1. That's over exactly, P1. Yeah. yeah. Yes, when but you said the, the Lepschus uh, theory is also classically over P1. But it, it doesn't. It's uh, similarly, we decompose P1 to two disks. And then you have to glue them together. Yeah, and yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. You have this loop of Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms, this clutching thing. Um, other questions? Do you expect this global Kuranishi chart construction to work for other of witten moduli spaces or Hamiltonian FLIR? Um, so I expect it to work well. Modified uh, the same sort of ideas. Let, let's say that bit this way: the same sort of ideas I think can be used to work for all kinds of moduli spaces. Um, uh, so, so we are working on higher genus, and I, I think, um, and. Um, the, the, there's only one thing that's a little bit harder, which is in, in our paper, we have this, we have a Gromov, we call it a Gromov trick to rewrite this thickened moduli space as a genuine moduli space of regular holomorphic curves on some other symplectic manifold. And then, you know, as a result, we can just use analysis from like McDuff Salomon's book to, to do all of this. Um, and that works very well for genus zero, but but it does. I, I have no idea how to do it for higher genus. So for higher genus, we have these, uh, you know, things like, you know, you really need gluing or something. So you still need obstruction bundle gluing and and, and so on. And uh, for, 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 so it's. I mean, that exists for higher genus curves, and so we can use that. Thank you. I had a question, um, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more, or maybe if I could just see the slide again about how Morava K theory allows you to put a virtual fundamental class on this global Kernishi chart. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I'll go to my other slides. Okay. So,
So this isn't about more of a K theory, but these are the sort of two properties we want for the virtual fundamental class to, 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 um, to be constructed. So you want Tom isomorphism and G equivariant Poincaré duality. My claim is this isn't so bad, but this, this one is very difficult. And you need these conditions to be able to integrate your virtual fundamental class and count your moduli space. Well, it, it, to, to, to construct your virtual fundamental class. So you, you basically have a manifold and a bundle over it. You know, you, like, like let, let, uh, let me say it like this. Um, imagine, imagine you have a smooth manifold and a smooth vector bundle over it and a, and a smooth section, which is transverse to zero, okay? So from, so I can put a, a, a fundamental class so the zero set of that section is a nice smooth manifold, right? And I can put a uh, fundamental class on it by taking the, um, by, by what, I, what can I do? I can take the fundamental class of my thickening T, like the, the larger manifold, and then I can take its capped product with the Euler class of the vector bundle. And, um, and then, yeah, so, so that will give me, that, that will ascend, so <clears throat> that, that will, you know, essentially give me a homology class representing the fundamental class of the zero set. You know, give me a homology class, well, inside the larger manifold, but it's the same as the, homo the fundamental class of the zero section. Uh, but but now if the section is not but this construction works well if the section is not transverse to zero like, you know, fundamental class and Euler class still makes sense. Um, so so that, that that's the sort of point. Um, but but you know f f to construct a you know you want to construct a fundamental class on this manifold initially, but in our case we don't have a manifold we have an orbifold. Um, well we're not really it, it's like T mod G. Which is an orbifold. Um, you know, everything's G equivariant and G has finite stabilizers. And so, um, you know, really this is kind of like Poincare duality sort of for an orbifold, which is the quotient T mod G. Um, and, and that's difficult to do. I see. And, and Morava K theory satisfies these two. Yeah, I didn't say why, but it's not a trivial thing. I'm just saying it satisfies these things. Assuming uh, these bundles are complex, um, you know, that those will give you that these identifications. And um, yeah, but my part of the point of this talk is, you know, you, you could just try and work just with that and do something with it. Um, yeah. Cool, thank you. Can you just remind me what's what is d exactly in your, like is d just sufficiently large or is there some d d uh is you mean the d of this cpd yeah so um let me find it this d yeah so that that's just that's just um this omega paired with beta so it's just the integral over beta of omega. So it's just the degree of this Hermitian line bundle with respect to beta. Right, but... Um, but and it's the but, same as the number of these, you know, the, D plus one is the number of these holomorphic sections by, you know, by riemann roch for genus, genus zero curves. Uh -huh. But, uh, but I think we should think it's large, right? It should be thought as very large. Yeah, yeah. You should, you should. Extremely large. I, I'm just wondering, like, how, how big does D have to be? Well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be that large because what, what has to be large, you see there's another ample line bundle, L, here. And this, this L to the K has to be large. That's what, that's what really has to be large. Because this, this curly L, so, so, so this, see, there's two line bundles. This, straight L and curly L. And straight L, it sort of stabilizes your domain. 
and curly L is what is used to sort of get you to subject onto the co-kernel of the DBAR operator. So is, is straight L just like in your case, you have just two mark points or something. So is it, is it just some small? There's no mark points. I, I, I'm just constructing the moduli space with no mark points. Actually, if you want right. to add mark points, there's a natural sort of pullback construction. So, so once you've done it for no mark points, you can do it for all mark points. I see. Um, But yeah, the, the point is this has to be really large. That's the, that's the key point, this K. You know, we fix L and make this K really, really large. And then what I didn't say is we use like Hormander's theorem to sort of prove that we can show that, that, it, that it, you know, it subjects onto the co um, Is there something in chat? Oh. It was just me. I didn't want to interrupt the discussion, but uh, I, before everybody disappears, I wanted to say that we're having a panel with six mathematicians, hopefully answering with different backgrounds, hopefully answering some questions about Fleur homotopy. Uh, it's the Friday after Thanksgiving. If anybody has questions, this is a link to a form where you can put your questions down. Sorry, Mark. I just thought it might be helpful to catch the audience. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. There's another question here. Who, want, who asked this question? I didn't see this. I think that, I think that was. That was covered already. Oh, it's covered. Okay, good. Yeah. I have one more. Um, yeah. What is J? Sorry. So, so is J anything for the construction J of these anything... moduli spaces, or well, do you J have is... to? Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Um, I J is anything satisfying appropriate properties. So, uh... I just meant in the construction of these global Kuranishi charts and to get your- Well, that can be anything. Yeah, that can be any J you want. Yeah. Okay, so you don't have to do any weird perturbing or whatnot. No, there's no perturbation. There's none or... of this. You, you, never, you don't use any of this perturbation stuff and generosity or anything like that. I see. Okay. Thank you. Well, the eta is the perturbation, right? I suppose, but we're, we're not really perturbing. We're not, we're not choosing like a multi-value section or anything. No, sure, sure, sure. But you're perturbing the equation, right? But yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah but single-valued, single-valued perturbation. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, you could call that a perturbation. I, I, I don't know what the right words are. So... Like, is it possible to just kind of black box this method? It's like, it seems like this, I mean, in genus zero, it seems like this, this is pretty powerful, right? It just sort of solves, like, I mean, it just gives you this. Can you adapt it to virtual fundamental chains? I guess that's one. Uh, well, there's two, I, I think constructing the global Kuranishi charts is fine in lots of settings. I mean, I wrote a sketch for like, uh, higher genus, and I wrote a sketch for genus zero SFT and Lagrangian disks on the Lagrangian and stuff. But but um, the hard part is constructing. You know, it, it, the topology is what's really hard. And I think Mohammed is with Fleur theory and stuff. Mohammed's working on this with Bloomberg to make it a bit more, I hope, user friendly for us. <laughs> so you and, mean the, um, when you say the topology, you mean like the, the so stable homotopy theory? Glo you know, getting a sort of system of getting a sort of, I don't know, a global Kuranishi chart like flow category or something like that, whatever that means. Um, I think that should be okay using these sorts of ideas. The, the hard part is the topology that, that involves some effort, uh, at least if you want to do like Murabake theory, I, I think. Since I was name checked, I'll just say, um, you know, I think, you know, in the paper with Blumberg, about one third of it was stuff about Kuranishi charts and gluing them together and things like that. And this basically kind of, you know, once we do this for Hamiltonian floor theory, which is not, which is actually much easier than higher genus, you know, anyway, once, once you implement this construction of global charts in Hamiltonian floor theory, you can get rid of that one third of the, of the length of the paper. But then there is all the bunch of stuff with which is basically about, you can think of it as like coherent virtual fundamental chains in spectra. And that's, 
you know, then you need something else to do that. And you either do it by, you know, following the methods that um, Andrew and I used, um, which, well, anyway, which are non-trivial and very, very, use very lots of heavy stable homotopy theory, or you have to come up with some other, other way to do it. So anyway, I, I would prefer for another way to do it, but but I'm just saying that's, that's the, you know, it helps a lot, but there is still a lot of, lot left to do to do chains. So um, I, I think I'm gonna turn off the recording and then uh, if anyone wants to stick around for, if Mark is available, we could, for informal questions, that's fine too. Yeah. Maybe we should thank Mark again. And thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>